Hi class, and welcome to our lecture on Chapter 14, The Foreign Sector. So, how does Canada fit into the global environment? Well, we are linked to the rest of the world through trade. In other words, we're linked to the rest of the world through our exports and imports. So, foreigners obviously enter Canadian product markets by buying Canadian exports, and in turn, Canadians buy foreign imports. Foreign spending on Canadian exports represents a monetary inflow, while Canadian spending on imports represents a monetary outflow from the Canadian economy. The same principles apply to trading in financial assets such as stocks and bonds. And so foreigners enter Canadian markets by buying Canadian stocks and bonds, thereby creating an inflow of funds to Canadian financial markets. And then of course the other way around. We can also buy as Canadians foreign stocks and bonds from foreigners and that creates an outflow of funds from Canadian financial markets. So the first thing we're going to talk about in this chapter is called the balance of payments accounts. So the balance of payments accounts essentially provides a summary of all of the transactions between Canadian residents and foreigners that involve in exchanging Canadian dollars for some other currency. So in a nutshell, it's keeping track of all of the transactions Canada has with the rest of the world. Now a receipt is shown by a positive sign and that represents a monetary inflow into the Canadian economy. That would be something like exports. Payments, on the other hand, show a negative sign and represent monetary outflows from the Canadian economy. So the overall balance payments is broken down into different accounts. The current account summarizes all foreign transactions associated with current economic activity in Canada involving Canadian dollars. And so there's different transactions that it includes. Uh, the first being trade in merchandise. Okay, so this is, you know, exports and imports of goods and goods and also any trades and services as well. Now, the third item is flows of investment income. So this isn't the, you know, stocks or bonds themselves, it's just the income from those types of instruments. And so if a Canadian owns a foreign, say, uh, US Treasury bill, the interest rate that they receive, that income uh, is, you know, uh, income coming into Canada. Okay, and so that is, you know, summarized under the current account, and that would be a receipt. Um, it also includes just transfers of money. So one-way transfers of assets, example, money received from those working abroad or direct foreign aid. Okay, so in this account, we're talking about exports and imports, any investment income from financial instruments. Uh, so it could be either interest or dividends. And then we're also talking about just people sending money to each other, okay? Now, the current account uh, can have a surplus or a deficit. A current account surplus occurs when this account's receipts would exceed its payments. Okay, so in that case, we had more receipts like, say, exports or people sending money into Canada. Then we had the opposite of those leaving. A current account deficit then occurs when payments exceed receipts. So the merchandise merchandise balance of trade equals merchandise exports, which are receipts, minus merchandise imports, which are the payments, money flowing out. So the balance of trade represents exports minus import payments for goods and services only. So that's one part of it. Let's look at a numerical example. So this is Canada's current account in 2013. So in terms of merchandise trade, we had receipts of 479, uh, I think this is in billions, and we had 486.3 billion in payments. And so the overall net is negative, okay? So we had more flows out than we did in, so we had payments greater than receipts of 7.2. Now that's just for merchandise trade then we have services okay so when we look at services we also had a deficit here of negative 24.5 and so the total balance of trade in other words our net exports was negative 31.8 billion and so this means that we sold more goods in or the sorry the you know we bought more goods and services from the rest of the world than they bought from us and so that's a negative and it's a you know a net outflow 
Now, in terms of investment income, uh, Canadians received $70 billion in investment income and dividends from assets they own in other countries. And on the other hand, foreigners owning Canadian assets received 94.5. So again, we have a deficit here of 23.8. And then if we look at transfers, we can see here that more money was sent by Canadians abroad than Canadians received from abroad. And so we have negative 5.0. So the overall current account uh, balance is negative 60.7 and since it's negative it's a deficit okay again the current account details receipts and payments for merchandise trade and non merchandise transactions uh, and so it's basically we're talking here about exports and imports investment income and just people sending each other cash transfers and so we had you know in contrast to the small deficit in merchandise trade a larger deficit occurred because of its balance of trade net exports overall the difference between the total receipts and total total payments give a current account deficit of $60.7 billion. Now the other major account is called the capital and financial account. Okay, so remember the current account, it did include investment income from say stocks and bonds, but it never included actually the actual flows associated with purchasing financial assets or foreign direct investment. So purchasing a plant or, or some other physical capital. So the capital account summarizes transfer of ownership of intangible assets, example, patents, copyright trademarks, you know, stocks, bonds, uh, you know, anything like that. Um, <clears throat> this, you know, category somewhat seems somewhat small. Um, the financial account though, so we can look at, a lot of times this is just called the capital account, um, but in we could think of the capital account as including both capital and financial accounts. So the financial account summarizes all foreign transactions of financial assets involving Canadian dollars, and they include three types of transactions portfolio investment. This is a financial invest investment that does not give the buyer controlling interest. So this is you purchasing some stocks for your retirement plan. Direct investment is a financial investment that gives the buyer controlling equity interest. And three other financial investments are linked to day-to-day -day fluctuations in bank deposits. So a capital and financial account surplus occurs when, again, you would have receipts exceeding payments. And so in words, it would mean Canadians spend less on foreign investments than foreigners spend on investments in Canada. So if a lot more, you know, more people invest in Canada than we invest, invest abroad, then there is more money coming in. So we have a surplus. A capital and financial accounts deficit occurs when you have payments exceeding receipts. And so Canadians spend more on foreign investments than foreigners spent on investments in Canada. And if we look again at Canada in 2013, here is our capital and financial accounts. So the, the capital account here, we had a deficit of negative 0.1. In the financial account, we look at our direct and portfolio investment. Here we actually had a surplus. And you, you can roughly think, okay, so in our current account that we just looked at previously, we basically... You could think of it as we, well, especially when you're thinking of the trade portion, we bought more from the rest of the world than they bought from us. And so the only way we could do that is if we borrowed money from abroad. So in this case, we should see that we have surpluses in the, the financial, because if someone lends us money, um, they are buying, say, a bond. And if you think of where the flow, of, the direction of the flow of money, if someone buys, say, a Canadian savings bond or, uh, you know, a corporate bond or anything like that. Uh, so if a foreigner buys those, then they're putting money into Canada and then they're owning that asset. Okay, so we we should see that the if we have a negative current account, we should have surpluses or positive capital. And so here we look at, we have direct investment, portfolio investment, other financial investments, and we see here that, that the receipts exceed the payment. And so the overall balance here is positive, and it's $63.1 billion in 2013. Okay, so again, let's just go over this to reinforce it. So the capital and financial accounts detail net flows for financial 
financial investment, uh, portfolio and direct investment, and other financial transactions. And so the large positive balance is for other financial investments, direct investments, and portfolio investments more than offset that little tiny uh, deficit we had in the capital account. <clears throat> and so the net result is that we have an overall surplus. So balance of payment surpluses and deficits. A balance of payments surplus is a positive net balance showing that receipts outweigh payments on the current account and capital and financial accounts combined. A balance of payments deficit is a negative balance showing that payments outweigh receipts on the current account and capital and financial accounts combined. So for 2013, we have that the current account is negative zero, sorry, negative 60.7 the capital and financial accounts was 63.1. In terms of the statistical discrepancy, you'll remember when we looked at GDP before, we saw that these types of things are not estimated precisely, right? Statistics Canada does a very good job at it, but you know sometimes you're going to be missing a few things here and there. Uh, these are overall good estimates, but they're not going to be perfect. So for the purposes here, just take the statistical discrepancy as given. So this is figured out by Statistics Canada, and we just add that amount. So when we add these three figures together, we get that the balance of payments surplus or deficit is 4.9, okay? And now, okay, so what's going on with this change in official reserves? Well, if you think about it, we had more money coming in for financial instruments than we had leaving. And so people need to buy Canadian dollars in order to purchase those assets. Okay, so if there were a balance of payment surplus, as we see here, there would be a negative change in official reserves equal to that amount. This negative change in the official reserves indicates that the Bank of Canada would have had to have inevitably sold Canadian dollars. And, you know, this is because people are buying more of our financial instruments than we're buying from them. So there's a, you know, you can think of foreigners needing to exchange their foreign currency into Canadian currency. And so the Bank of Canada would need to sell Canadian dollars and this causes an outflow and they would have needed to buy foreign currency and so <clears throat> we have that the change in official reserves is just the opposite uh, sign of the balance of payments so the overall balance of payments then will be equal to zero okay and so the yeah so that's the main procedure here so you have your current account your capital and financial account you add your statistical discrepancy this would be given and then you end up with your balance of payment surplus or deficit uh, and then this is going to be directly offset by change in, changes in official reserves. Now it's important to point out that the two terms balance of trade or balance of payments or merchandise balance of trade or net exports are typically confused. Okay so the balance of trade or balance of payments here would be equal always equal to zero. So in the media sometimes they'll say the uh, you know balance of you know trade or the the balance of payments is something like 50 billion dollars but they're typically referring to just the merchandise balance of trade so they're just talking about whether we have a trade deficit or a trade surplus so a lot of times this is mixed up in news accounts so just just be aware and uh, you know make sure that you know exactly what they're talking about usually what is interesting for the news is to report on the trade uh, balance so whether that's a surplus or or deficit. So let's elaborate more on the changes in official reserves. So the change in official reserves account shows the Bank of Canada's buying and selling of foreign currency in the foreign exchange market. And this is usually to manage the Canadian dollars exchange value. And this is going to be equal in value and opposite sign to the surplus or deficit noted in the overall balance of payments. A negative change in official reserves indicates that the Bank of Canada sold Canadian dollars, creating an outflow by buying foreign foreign currency and a positive change in official reserves indicates that the Bank of Canada bought Canadian dollars creating an inflow by selling foreign currency. Okay so let's do an active learning question. So for each of the following transactions identify where it appears on Canadian current account and whether it is classified as a receipt or payment. Okay so for A hit pause. Okay I'm back. So in A it says a Canadian movie chain purchases the rights to screen an Italian film in Canada. Okay so the answer here is uh, screening a film as a service, so that's going to go into the, the current account, right? And so that's going to be part of trade and services. 
And because a Canadian firm is purchasing a, a foreign product, the transaction is classified as a payment. So you can think of it as an outflow. Okay, and B, it says an American family purchases a Canadian made trailer for their summer vacation. So hit pause, think about it. Okay, I am back. And so the answer here clearly is a trailer is a tangible good. So this tra transaction is part of merchandise trade. Okay, so basically we've had, we have an export here. And so because a foreigner is purchasing a Canadian product, the transaction is classified as a receipt. The next one C says a Canadian sends a monetary gift to relatives in India. So hit pause. Okay, so what's the answer here? Well, this is a transfer, right? And it's a transfer from a Canadian resident to a non-Canadian resident and so this would be a considered a, a payment right it's money leaving and it's a considered a unilateral transfer and this would be under the current account um, the next one says a Canadian shareholder receives dividends from a Japanese corporation so hit pause and try and think of the answer okay I'm back and so clearly here we have an inflow right we have a Canadian getting money from abroad and so share you know you're basically here you're having dividend so this is investment income for a Canadian resident and so we would consider this as a receipt and again these are all under the uh, current account okay so let's now talk about foreign exchange rates so any transaction that appears on the balance of payment accounts involves trading Canadian dollars for another currency and so the balance of payments transactions that are classified as receipts must first start with a foreign you know there must be so if someone is buying a, a, an extra export from us. So if someone buys maple syrup in another country, you know, at some point they, they're going to need to convert their their for, you know, their foreign currency into Canadian currency to make the purchase. In Canada, we use Canadian dollars, so that's what we want to get payment in. And so anything classified as a receipt must first start with a foreign currency uh, transaction where you have um, foreign currency being sold to buy Canadian dollar. For example, if a French company purchases Canadian paper sold in France, um, they're, you know, they're going to trade their European euros for Canadian dollars to buy the Canadian paper company. And oh, sorry, this is a company that we're buying, not just paper. So anyways, anytime, you know, someone needs to buy something in Canada, they need to convert their foreign currency into Canadian currency. In contrast, transactions that are classified as payments first start with Canadian dollars being sold to buy foreign currency. So for example, a Canadian buying the services of a Japanese architect um, would exchange Canadian dollars for Japanese yen to pay the tax. So currencies are traded in the global foreign exchange market. The exchange rate is the value of one nation's currency in terms of another currency, and it can be expressed in different ways. And so, for example, um, the best way to look at this is to first think about uh, this expression here. So this is saying that one US dollar is equal to 1.356 Canadian dollars. So you can think of on a table, you have a US $1 bill, and then on the right of that, you have a Canadian loonie with you know 35 cents and chain these two are equivalent and so if we just you know we can just move this CAD over here and we'll get this expression here and so the way this is expressed is it, it's basically saying how much Canadian dollars do you need to buy a US dollar okay so since we're in Canada this is saying how much domestic currency do we need to buy foreign currency now we can also express this same relationship the other way around. We could say that one Canadian dollar is equal to 0 0.7346 Canadian dollars. So where do we get this 0.7376 from? Well, if you look at this here, what we could do is rewrite this so that this is equal to one, right? So then we would have one Canadian dollar equals something over here. Well, we could just divide both sides by 1.356. And if we do that, this will be one Canadian dollar dollar equals one divided by 1.356. That's where this is coming from here. And so when you calculate that, you get the 0.73746. And so if the exchange rate is expressed like this, we're, we're saying how much foreign currency do we need to buy one Canadian dollar? In this case, it's 0.738 rounded up. Okay. So the exchange rate can be expressed in terms of the domestic or foreign currency. Okay.
Now, one important application of exchange rates is to determine prices of products in terms of foreign currency. So let's consider US and Canada. So the US dollar price of a Canadian product is then obviously gonna be equal to the Canadian dollar price times the US dollars to buy one Canadian dollar, okay? Um, the Canadian price of a US product is gonna be the US dollar price times the Canadian dollars to buy one US dollar. So for example, consider a Canadian export with a Canadian price of $20. Uh, and that's sold in the US, okay? So what is the US dollar price? Let's suppose that the exchange rate has a value of US 0 0.90 for each Canadian dollar. Well then, the US dollar price of this t-shirt is just going to be the Canadian dollar price times the US dollars to buy one Canadian dollar. And in this case, it's 90 cents. And so we know that the price will be lower uh, in US dollars because you know their dollar can buy more of our dollar and so the US dollar price would be 18 which is 20 times 0 0.9 the US price of this product is therefore 18 okay so let's do an active learning question to reinforce the material suppose that a euro is worth 1.5 Canadian dollar how much is a Canadian dollar worth in euro so you may want to hit pause try and figure it out okay I'm back so the answer to this question is as follows so in the question we're told that one euro is equal to 1.5 Canadian Canadian dollar. And so we're interested in what one Canadian dollar is worth in euro. So we want to divide both sides by 1.5. When we do that, we get one divided by 1.5 euros is equal to one Canadian dollar. And when we work out this fraction, we get 0 0.67. Next question. Suppose that one Canadian dollar equals 80 Japanese yen. How much is a yen worth in Canadian dollar? So hit pause, try and figure it out. I'll be back in a sec. Okay, I'm back. So then here we're given given that one Canadian dollar is equal to 80 yen. And so we just want to divide both sides by 80 and we get that one yen is worth 0 0.0125 Canadian dollars. Next question says, suppose a US product imported to Canada has a US price of $40. What's the imports Canadian dollar price? Suppose that the exchange rate has a value of Canadian 1.1 for each US dollar. So basically here we're told that one US dollar is equal to 1.1 Canadian dollars. Okay, so hit pause and try and figure it out. Okay, I'm back. Okay, so we're told that, you know, we're given this information. So the Canadian price, first of all, we know it's going to be higher because the US dollar is worth more and it's originally quoted in US dollars. So we're just saying, you know, what, how much Canadian dollars would it take to buy this thing? Well, we know that a Canadian dollar is you know worth less than the US so we're gonna need more um, and so we're told that uh, for each US dollar we need a dollar eleven to buy a US dollar so we need to buy 40 US dollars and so 40 times 1.11 is equal to 44.40 and so the items Canadian price would be 44.40 now how are exchange rates determined well they're determined in a market and so in any market we have demand and supply. So to see how exchange rates are set, we must look at the demand for and supply of Canadian currency and foreign exchange markets. So we will use an exchange rate defined as the number of US dollars needed to purchase a Canadian dollar. So we're gonna define and use just this exchange rate, right? So it's um, how much foreign currency is needed to buy the domestic currency. So how much US dollars are needed to purchase a Canadian dollar. So the demand for Canadian dollars is the relationship between the price of a Canadian dollar and the quantity demanded in exchange for another currency. Now the demand curve is gonna have a negative slope um, and that is, you know, it's going to be determined by foreign export buyers. Since the Canadian dollar means that, um, <clears throat> sorry, since the higher a higher Canadian dollar means that Americans find Canadian products more expensive, they're gonna buy fewer of them. In terms of the supply, we're talking about, so the supply is gonna come from Canadians who are buying foreign exchange. So it's the relationship between the price of a Canadian dollar and the quantity supplied in exchange for another currency. The supply curve will have a positive slope um, and that, you know, it, the positive slope is determined by Canadian import buyers. So when we buy something from abroad, and 
so when we buy something from abroad, we're going to be selling, think of selling Canadian dollars on the foreign exchange market and then buying uh, foreign currency. So a higher Canadian dollar is beneficial if we want to import from another country. So it means that Canadians would find American products cheaper and so they will buy more of them. So it's easier to uh, visualize all of this. So this is the demand curve for Canadian dollars and these are the exchange rates. So this is the price of can of a Canadian dollar in US, okay? So it's how much, you know, of the people in the US would have to pay for a Canadian dollar. And so the higher is this number, we are thinking of the Canadian dollar appreciating, right? Because the higher this number means the more foreigners would have to give up of their currency to buy ours. So the higher this number means our currency is appreciating. And so that would make our exports more expensive. And so that's why we have a negative relationship. The higher this is, the less quantity of Canadian dollars would be demanded by people who would want to buy our exports. Um, on the other hand, the more our currency appreciates, the more we would want to buy imports. You know, we can think of shopping on eBay at a U.S., you know, from U people selling from the U.S. When that price gets converted in the Canadian dollars, it's going to be better for us if our currency is appreciating. You know, the higher or the more, you know, the, the more value our currency has. So the, the more you go in this upward direction, the more we'd want to buy uh, from the US it's basically like we're getting a discount on the product and so the more you know the higher this value is the more we would want to be supplying our Canadian dollars in order to buy foreign currency and so that's why this is upward sloping and so as, a, as in any market we discussed this before there's going to be a tendency to go towards the equilibrium right at any exchange rate other than this equilibrium exchange rate we're either going to have a surplus or shortage so uh, here at this value of the exchange rate there would be a greater supply than a demand and so there would be a tendency for the exchange rate to fall so the only stable point is the equilibrium point and so I mean if you think of the foreign exchange market this you know this would be very much a moving target the, you know the demand and supply is going to be shifting and moving around all the time you know it's a very uh, advanced market uh, but you know you this is you were just thinking of you know the the main underlying uh, you know what's going on behind the scenes here uh, so anyway supply and demand determines the exchange rate. so when an exchange rate is allowed to vary foreign exchange markets will reach equilibrium where demand and supply are equal that's what we just mentioned um, so if the currency appreciates that means it's strengthening and that means its price in terms of another currency is increasing if it's depreciating that means we have to give up more of our currency to buy a foreign currency so you know its price is falling in terms of the other currency so changes in exchange rate so four factors can affect exchange rates or in other words um, you know result in and shifts in the curve so price differences if the there's a rise in the prices of Canadian goods and services relative to America's um, that will reduce demand and increase the supply of Canadian dollars and so this is going to uh, you know lower its price in terms of the US so just think of it here if for whatever reason our goods became more expensive maybe we've become inefficient or we've had some kind of a cost increase well then less people are going to want to buy from us from the US okay and so less people are going to want to buy Canadian dollars you know at, you know so what's going to happen then is the uh, demand curve would shift to the left now product demand so a rise in demand for Canadian products would rise uh, you know would raise demand and reduce the supply of Canada's currency and it would you know it raises its price in terms of other currency so you know we're basically saying here if there's an increase in the demand for a product that's going to increase its price okay and then people who I mean all we're saying Saying in this second one here is that if Canadians for some reason want to buy more domestic goods instead of importing then there's going to be less people wanting to exchange their Canadian dollars for foreign currencies and so that's going to reduce the supply of Canada's currency and it will uh, raise its price in terms of other currencies so just think of it that you know there's less people offering 
uh, Canadian dollars for sale. So they're, you know, in a sense being coming more scarce. Okay. And so that would increase the price of Canadian dollar. Now, next, uh, three, interest rates are very important. Um, if there is an increase in, say, the interest rate on government treasury bills, then there are a lot of mutual funds and pension funds that need to park their money in very short term liquid um, financial instruments like T bills. And so if our interest rate is higher than, say, the U.S. and for for equivalent T bills, which are both pretty much risk free because they're gov you know they're backed by the government, then you can imagine a lot of these pension funds or mutual funds would want to park their money in a Canadian T bill because they can get a higher interest rate. And in order to do that, they need to buy Canadian dollars to buy our T bill. And so that would you know that would end up appreciating our currency. Speculation, of course, is also a component of the market. So sometimes you know you get these. Uh, self-fulfilling prophecies. So if there's signs that Canadian currency will likely increase relative to a foreign currency, um, that means there'd be an immediate increase in demand and a, de and a decrease in supply of Canada's currency. And so this will increase its price in terms of the foreign currency. So basically you have sort of a, a, a self-perpetuating thing going on. If everyone thinks that something's going to happen, they'll behave in a way that will make it happen. Okay, so here we have on the left a decrease in demand shown as the shift from D0 to D1. And then we have an increase in supply shown as the shift from S0 to S1. And so this, the net effect here will cause the Canadian dollar to appreciate from point A to point B. Conversely, on this other diagram, if we have an increase in demand from D2 to D3, so we have the demand curve shifting to the right, but at the same time, we have the supply curve shifting to the left, we would end up with the currency appreciating from C to D. Okay, so the demand and supply curves uh, can shift, and when they shift, they're going to affect the new equilibrium exchange. Okay, so I'll let you do this active learning question for homework. I think uh, it would be good for you to do on your own and then check, make sure you do it first and then check the solutions afterwards. Okay, now let's talk about different exchange rate regimes. So a flexible or floating exchange rate regime means that there's no government intervention in the foreign exchange market. So the market forces are allowed to operate freely. Okay, um, a fixed exchange rate is where exchange rates are set or pegged to a certain value uh, by a country's government. So, you know, example, the Hong Kong dollar is pegged at 7.8 per US dollar. The Chinese renminbi is pegged at 6.8 per US dollar. So a target exchange rate below the equilibrium creates an excess demand for currency and a balance of payment surplus. Remember when we looked at micro and we talked about price floors and price ceilings, uh, a fixed exchange rate is very similar, right? It, the government's setting the price and so depends on where it sets it, it you know could result in a surplus or shortage where you know, relative to the equilibrium where the market actually wants to go. And then it has to deal with those surpluses and shortage. And so if the target exchange rate is below the equilibrium, it's going to create an excess demand for the currency and a balance of payments surplus. And in order to maintain the pegged rate, the central bank may need to reduce demand by reducing interest rates or selling domestic currency in foreign exchange markets. So if there's excess demand for our currency, there's going to be a tendency for the exchange rate to want to increase. To prevent that, what the central bank would have to do is, you know, make, you know, supply that excess demand. So they would, you know, just go on the foreign exchange market and, you know, they'd have to, you know, they're basically creating new money in this sense because they're they're just using money that's not in the system. Canadian dollars aren't in circulation to, to buy this and to make sure that they keep the exchange rate fixed. And so that could result in some inflation. And the other situation would be if the target exchange rate is above the equilibrium, it will create the opposite situation where you have an excess supply for of the currency and a balance of payments deficit. So if, so then the central bank, in order to maintain the fixed exchange rate would have to buy this supply of Canadian dollars. But what is it going to buy it with? It has to buy it with foreign exchange and it only has a certain amount of foreign exchange reserves. So uh, it can only do this, you know, for so long before it runs out of foreign exchange reserves. So a low fixed exchange rate would stimulate exports, right? So that 
you know that that would be I, I think uh, China does this they you know they have a fixed exchange rate and so you know they can lower that fixed exchange rate and automatically you know Chinese goods would be cheaper to us because we don't have to give up as much of our currency to get their currency um, but you know it, it depends on when you do this this is a you know a policy you could do if you wanted to stimulate the economy uh, however I mean uh, most Western nations uh, have a floating or flexible exchange rate so they don't do this sort of thing and the reason why they don't is because if you fix the exchange rate then you give up your power of monetary policy because you know you're going to be printing you're going to be increasing the money supply if you're buying uh Can you know, if you're selling uh, canadian dollars on the foreign exchange market and so that interferes with any monetary policy so you can't have both uh you can only have one or the other um and so anyways back you know assuming that we have have a fixed exchange rate um, a high fixed exchange rate would you know make it beneficial for us to be able to buy goods from other the other country because it would be cheaper for us but it would reduce our um, exports okay so here again we have a foreign exchange market with fixed exchange rates the target value of the Canadian dollar can differ from the equilibrium determined by the market demand and supply curve so this is basically what we were just talking about uh, a target level above um, you know such as say points a here would you know if we targeted this to be our fixed exchange rate the market wants to go here right and so we're going to end up with a balance of payments uh, deficit in this case um, and that that's because at this higher exchange rate, the supply of Canadian dollars is going to exceed the demand of Canadian dollars. We end up with a surplus, right? And and so in order to prevent the exchange rate from falling back down to here, the central bank would have to buy, you know, go on the market and buy up this uh, surplus. And so they're going to have to buy this with foreign exchange. So their foreign exchange reserves could eventually be depleted, and then that will force the uh, market out. So if they're trying to prop their currency up above the equilibrium, they need to do that by uh, supplying, you know, by exchange. The central bank would have to exchange, um, would have to buy uh, Canadian dollars with foreign exchange uh, reserves. Now, if the exchange rate is fixed below, you have a surplus at this exchange rate. And in other words, a, sorry, a, yeah, a shortage at 0 0.89. And to prevent this from going up, you have to, you know, uh, supply that shortage. And so the central bank bank can easily supply Canadian dollars so they would be buying the foreign exchange with Canadian dollars so there have been three major exchange rate systems used by industrialized countries in the past 150 years uh, the gold standard was the way things were uh, you know back in the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century uh, and it essentially meant that each country set the value of its currency in terms of an amount of gold so they f basically everything was fixed to to gold uh, the Bretton Woods system was based on an adjustable fixed exchange rates uh, so they got rid of the uh, gold standard after that um, basically most countries follow what's called a managed float so like in Canada it's basically a flexible exchange rate um, but sometimes the government might get involved in the foreign exchange market um, you know, just in case there's a something going on, maybe they want to mitigate the the fall or rise of the exchange rate because of some event that that has happened. This is the uh, U.S. Canadian dollar exchange rates from 1950 to 2010. We can see that they're far from being you know steady over time. You know, we've had situations where uh, you know our dollar was worth more than the U.S., but for the most part, our dollar was worth less, which is good for our export industry. Uh, back in 2010, we had uh, the Canadian dollar being you know a little bit above or being at par. And then it has fallen a lot uh, since then. So, um, yeah, it, you know, it fluctuates widely uh, over time. Here's a more updated uh, picture. So this is 2010 to 2000 and, uh, early 2019. And we can see that the Canadian dollar fell a lot 
depreciated a lot since this peak here. A lot of this is because of the fall or collapse in the price of oil. We produce oil and so people need to buy Canadian dollars to get our oil so we don't, the value of oil is much less so the less Canadian dollars need. So final question, which is better? Having a currency that is strong or weak? Well, it's kind of a trick question. Neither one is ideal. It depends. Um, a strong currency will weaken demand for a country's goods and services so it will be negative to our export export industry um, because you know people in other countries would have to give up more of their currency to get ours and so things become more expensive um, so you know a strong currency will tend to negatively impact the export sector um, a weak currency on the other hand will increase exports and decrease imports which will increase aggregate demand overall um, but I mean you know if this is done you know if our currency depreciates by a lot and we're already near our potential output we would have the the situation where you know we might have to start to be really worried about inflation and that's because we would be you know you would be stimulating the economy when it's already stimulated enough um, so ideally a country would want its currency at a level that leads to neither a, a current account surplus nor a current account deficit um, this I let we'll just keep it at that but I'm not this is not exactly true in my opinion it all depends on the situation just because a country has a a trade deficit doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad so think of Canada if all the trade we did was for vegetables in the winter time we're gonna have a trade deficit and we're always gonna have a trade deficit but that makes a lot of sense that wouldn't be bad because it would be too expensive for us to grow in our winter climate we'd have to have expensive greenhouses so it's better for us to just buy from another country that has better weather and can produce these much cheaper and if that's all we bought from another country we would have a trade deficit and would that necessarily be bad not really so yeah it really depends on the the context okay so that concludes our lecture for today so again this is chapter 14 here are some practice problems you should attempt and complete and make sure you do the pre-class uh, quiz for our final next class which is next week all right take care and bye for now